Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Music Sigma Phi Sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. The webinar will begin in 10 minutes. 
Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the New Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year. In cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the New Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. Webinar will begin in five minutes. Please stand by.
Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the Mu Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year. In cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UP Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar, depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. Good morning, everyone. I am Christine Arquiza, Mu Sigma Phi Sorority, Batch 1999, speaking on behalf of the Aging and Longevity Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority. 
We are streaming live from the video conference room of the UP Manila Information Management Service. Our time in Manila is now exactly 12 noon. We have a total of 900 plus registered to this webinar from all over the Philippines and from other countries as well. For today's webinar, we are privileged to have a distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine, Class 1992. She is a graduate of the University of the Philippines, College of Medicine, and she had her specialty residency training for otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the UP PGH. She completed a fellowship in otology at the University of Minnesota with Dr. Michael Paparella and graduated as Master's in Health Professions Education at the NTTC UP Manila. Presently, she is the director of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, UPCM, Associate Professor for at the UP College of Medicine, and attending otorhinolaryngologist at the Asian Hospital and Medical Center, Manila Doctors Hospital, Medical Center Manila, and UP PGH. She is a fellow of the Philippine Society of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and the Philippine College of Surgeons. Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud and honored to welcome Dr. Teresa Luisa Cruz, Mu Sigma Phi Sorority, Batch 1992. Thank you, Tim. Good, good afternoon. I applaud the UP College of Medicine, headed up by our beloved Dean Charlotte M. Chong, and the Mu Sigma Phi sorority, headed by our most exalted sister, Marielle Yasmin Salces, for conducting this very important and relevant medical webinar series on aging and longevity, and I'd like to say a personal thank you for including hearing loss in the spotlight. So let me share with you my take on hearing loss in aging adults. This is the outline of our module. We'll review some basic anatomy and physiology, review how we hear and what abnormalities can cause hearing loss. The human ear is made up of three divisions. We have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. From the outside of the head to the inside of the skull, we have the ear. Most people, especially, especially the lay, just think of the ear as this part, but actually majority of the ear is inside our skull. The outer ear is lined by skin and it is made up of the pina or the auricle and the ear canal. This is the so-called eardrum or tympanic membrane. It is the boundary between the outer ear and the middle ear. The middle ear is an air-filled space that is actually connected to the nose, the back of the nose and the throat by means of a tube called the eustachian tube. And the third division, which is deepest in the base of the skull and nearest the brain, is called the inner ear. When we do our examination of the ear and use our otoscope, this is the picture that we see. You have the ear canal lined by skin, just like skin anywhere else in the body. And this is the normal tympanic membrane or eardrum. It is very thin, translucent, and beyond it is the middle ear space containing the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. How do we hear? Hearing does not only involve the ear. We need our ears up to the brain for us to hear and for us to understand what we hear. The process of hearing starts from the external ear where the pina collects sounds and is transmitted in the ear canal, the middle ear is used as a conductive mechanism for the sound waves, and the inner ear is the one responsible for transforming mechanical energy to electrical energy that is transmitted to the brain and is the only kind of energy that the brain can interpret. Let us review how we hear. 
Oh, there is no audio for the video. So sound waves enter the ear canal and strike the eardrum, leading to the movement of the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The stapes at its foot plate will then be responsible for conducting mechanical waves to the fluid inside the cochlea. And this fluid will result in the movement of hair cells, which are sensory organs in the cochlea. The movement of the fluid and the movement of the hair cells will transform mechanical energy into electrical energy there that will be detected by the vestibulocochlear nerve and directed to the brain. Any abnormality, therefore, in hearing, oh, sorry, not any abnormality, but any lessening of our capacity to hear normally is called hearing loss. Because there are other abnormalities in hearing, like ringing in the ear or uh, ear fullness or distorted sounds. So around 5% of the world's population or 466 million people have disabling hearing loss. Adults make, 400, make up 432 million of this, and it is estimated that by the year 2050, over 900 million people will have disabling hearing loss. Hearing loss may, may result from various factors such as genetic causes, complications at birth, infectious diseases, chronic ear infections, use of particular drugs, exposure to excessive noise, and our topic, aging. Actually, approximately one-third of people over 65 years of age are retirement age at UP are affected by disabling hearing loss. So by the time we retire, one-third of us will have some disabling hearing loss. And this is, uh, the prevalence is greatest in our region, South Asia, Asia Pacific, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Hearing loss, according to its severity, may be classified into mild, moderate, severe, or profound. We call this hearing thresholds. It's the softest sound that you can hear as measured by decibels, which is the unit for the volume of sound. Therefore, if your, the softest sound that you can hear is already 25 decibel, decibels, then you are classified to have mild hearing loss and you might not hear the ocean waves, the rustling of the leaves. If you have profound hearing loss, the softest sound that you can already hear is that of the ringing of the telephone. And you miss out on conversation, which is at 60 decibels. You miss out definitely on the rustling of the leaves. The World Health Organization has its own classification. And this is important because they have classified that if you have at least a moderate hearing loss, you are already considered to have a disability. And mind you, look at these figures. For a child, the minimum threshold to be classified as someone with disability is only 31 decibels, emphasizing the importance of normal hearing in a child who is still developing in all aspects and needs a normal hearing function to develop optimally. Hearing loss can also be classified into either conductive or sensory neural. When the condition causing hearing loss is in the outer ear or the middle ear, then the hearing loss is called a conductive hearing loss. But if the condition is in the inner ear, then the resulting hearing loss is called sensory neural. At this point, when I explain to my patients this is one of my favorite statements. The deeper the problem, the more challenging the solution. Whenever a patient comes to me, whether pediatric or adult, complaining about the ear, anything about the ear, hearing loss, discharge, ear pain, I always want the problem to be just in the outer ear for the simple reason 
that it's easy to see, it's easy to diagnose, and most importantly, it's so easy to treat. Often than not, you provide a complete solution for the patient's concern. But if you have a middle ear problem, or worse, an inner ear problem, the solution may be more challenging. The aging adult, as we've said, carries the burden of hearing loss from various causes. And as already in the poster for this webinar, one third of people, I will repeat, aged 65 years and above are affected by significant hearing loss. And we cannot overemphasize the importance of this statement and its ramifications, not only on the ability to hear per se, but on its consequences on the individual, mental, emotional um, state, and um, his or her social interactions, and his family and work relations. So it is really important to be concerned about hearing loss for all populations and also for the aging populations. What are the causes of hearing loss in the aging adults? Let's take it up based on those that cause conductive hearing loss and those that cause sensory neural hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss can come from outer ear conditions and it is not uncommon in a day, for an adult, sometimes, or even frequently, for an elderly to come, they have a sad face. They are accompanied by relatives. Doctora, kailangan ko na huyata ng hearing aid. And the lolo and the lola is sad. And in my mind, I say, sana tutuli lang ito. Kasi alam ko po, pag natanggal ko ang tutuli, mapapasaya ko si lolo o si lola. Impacted serumen is not a disease. Wax or serumen is a normal product of the glands present in the skin of the outer ear canal. It's just that some people have so much of it. And coupled with the action of always using cotton buds, there's a tendency to push them inwards and lead to discomfort and a significant hearing loss. We soften it, the ENT specialists remove it, and it is very gratifying to see the smile on the patient's face, especially the elderly, when you bring their hearing instantly back to baseline upon removal. Kahit kaunti pa lang ang natatanggal mo, basta na-establish mo lang yung pathway ng sound waves, agad liwanag na ang kanilang pakiramdam, lalo na pag nasaid mo. So, back to normal, no problem. Other foreign bodies can obstruct the ear canal and therefore lead to some degree of hearing loss. Cotton um, coming loose from the cotton buds can lead to an obstruction that um, result to a complaint of hearing loss. You remove it, you're back to baseline. It can be partial, it can be total. Just remove it, you have the proper instrumentation. When I say just remove it, I'm talking to the EMT doctor. So take, take the patient to the EMT doctor who has the expertise and the proper instruments to take this out without causing further damage to the hearing mechanism. Foreign bodies can be animate. Of course, there will be pain. Hearing loss is not the primary complaint. When ants, um, cockroaches, any animate foreign body, um, usually it's a cockroach that uh, gets into the ear canal, there is pain, the ENT specialist um, drowns the foreign body, the animate foreign body, when it is already dead, it is safely removed. And again, lo and behold, the patient, is normal after that and is back to baseline. Sometimes other foreign bodies uh, are present like sand from swimming and the ENT specialist can just flush it out carefully and um, patient again is back to normal. Not a permanent disability, the solution is there com for complete cure. Otitis externa can be caused by infections of fungal origin. Sa Tagalog po, amag. Inaamag din po ang tenga. 
Very common in countries where the weather conditions are humid. Fungi love moist and closed spaces like the ear canal. So, if lagi pong medyo basa ang loob ng tenga, madali pong magkaroon ng amag, it can lead to varying degrees of hearing loss, can be partial obstruction, can be total obstruction. Again, protocol, treat with an antifungal, usually a topical antifungal can solve the problem. It is prescribed for two to three weeks. The ENT has to clean the ear canal and the patient will be under his care for about two to three weeks. And again, the solution is most of the time achieving complete cure. Whenever we are so fond of using the cotton buds, it is not uncommon for us to have swelling of the ear canal and even infection. It is a condition called diffuse otitis externa, very common. Hearing loss is a complaint, but the chief complaint is pain. And again, because it's an infection, it's treated with antibiotics and um. Uh, usually, topical antibiotics are all that is necessary, meaning ear drops. We don't usually prescribe oral or systemic antibiotics for diffuse otitis externa, but sometimes when the disease is extensive, we have to use systemic antibiotics. Again, this is a picture of swelling of the ear canal. You cannot even apply the ear drops anymore, so in these cases, you may have to use your systemic antibiotics. Now, a severe form of diffuse otitis externa, which can be found in the elderly, especially those who are immunocompromised, is a condition called malignant otitis externa. This is actually a misnomer. This is in no way cancerous. The term malignant has been used through the decades because of the propensity of the disease to be aggressive. It is actually a necrotizing disease, not only involving the soft tissues of the ear, but also the surrounding bone of the skull. It can involve the base of the skull and lead to dire consequences. And this um, uh, requires long-term systemic antibiotic treatment. And see, you already have a granulation tissue there, which can be actually mistaken for a tumor. Benign tumors in the ear canal can be present and obstruct the conduction of sound waves. These are bony benign tumors called ostroma, very frequent in our fishermen who are, and people who have water exposure in their ears most of the time. Of course, malignancies are also possible in the ear canal. And when it is there, it can present as an obstructive hearing loss. And therefore, a biopsy is warranted and appropriate medical and surgical management have to be instituted. Going deeper into the skull, you have middle ear conditions. I mentioned earlier that the middle ear is connected by means of the eustachian tube to the nasopharynx, which is the area at the back of the nose and throat. So any condition here in the upper respiratory tract, whether it's infection, the common cold is viral, or a bacterial sinusitis, or common nowadays, allergic rhinitis. Kahit anong nandito po, pwedeng makaapekto sa middle ear through the eustachian tube and its malfunction. We have a disease called acute otitis media. The middle ear space is infected from an upper respiratory tract infection. It presents with pain and hearing loss. Since it's an infection, we treat it with antibiotics. It has the second stage. Ang laman po dapat ng middle ear ay hangin or air. Sa second stage ng acute otitis media called exudative otitis media, Napalitan na po ng sipon ang hangin sa middle ear. Barado ang tenga, increase ang hearing loss, and we have increasing pain. There is nowhere for the sipon to go, but to create a hole in the eardrum so that it can egress to the area of high 
pressure to the area of least pressure. Therefore, you have luga or discharge from the middle ear as a product of the infection. This disease, acute otitis media, is common, especially in the pediatric population. And it is reversible most of the time and treated with the appropriate antibiotics. But if it is not treated well, especially in areas where access to appropriate medical care is hard to come by, the disease can persist. The perforation can persist. Patient has hearing loss all throughout his or her life until adulthood. And worse, the infection can progress to the formation of a so-called cholesteatoma, a product of long-standing middle ear infection. We see in our, in our elderly population, patients with chronic suppurative otitis media with cholesteatoma. And since cholesteatoma is associated with a dangerous ear, why? Because cholesteatoma is associated with enzymes that can cause lysis or necrosis of bone. Ang tenga po nasa bungo. Ang mga buto po na nagsosurround ng tenga, mga boundaries. Pag na-violate po yung boundaries ng yon, kung saan-saan pwedeng pumunta ang infeksyon. Ang most feared, pataas, papunta po sa ating cranial, intracranial space. So, diseases of the middle ear and the mastoid can cross the narrow, the thin bone called the tegment and infect the meninges leading to meningitis or the brain leading to brain abscess. And appropriate medical and usually surgical management by the ENT specialists have to be instituted. This condition is called otitis media with effusion. Wala pong sakit, walang pamamaga, pero mahina ang pandinig, barado ang tenga. This is a condition where there is fluid inside the middle ear or mucus in the middle ear, but there is no infection. Sometimes we have to do a miringotomy, meaning make a small incision in the eardrum and suction out all the fluid that has been stuck in the middle ear space. Tumors can also occur in the middle ear causing hearing loss in adults and this is treated surgically. A condition called autosclerosis still in the middle ear is an abnormal bone consistency in the stapes foot plate resulting to conductive hearing loss because of the failure of the ossicles to conduct sound waves properly. So, for conductive hearing losses, pinakamadali pong solusyonan, outer ear problems. Middle ear can be more of a challenge, but still there is hope for cure. Always po, pinakamahirap, inner ear conditions. Conditions that cause sensory neural hearing loss. Solutions are very difficult to find. How can you solve genetic causes for hearing loss. More than 40 genes have been identified to cause deafness. Around 300 syndromes genetically linked have been, uh, have identified hearing loss as one of its components. Genetic abnormalities can be mutations or chromosomal abnormalities. And specifically mitochondrial mutations have been associated with late onset hearing loss. And this is one of the pathophysiological mechanisms for age-related hearing loss without evident disease, which is presbycusis. How can you fight so much congenital hearing loss? Sad but true. Maternal infections, rubella, cytomegalovirus, toxoplasmosis, passed on to the fetus, fetus born with profound hearing loss most of the time. Babies born with hypoplastic auditory nerves. Babies born with cochlear abnormalities. And if there's no um, timely intervention, they may be confined to a life of being deaf instead of being able to hear. 
Autotoxicity is something we can prevent. Prevention is the key because once it has done its damage, it is irreversible or most of the time irreversible. Medications, uh, the most notorious ones are aminoglycosides. In the elderly population now, we see patients with severe hearing losses, sensory neural, from streptomycin treatment for tuberculosis in the early part of the previous century. We also have loop diuretics. Sildenafil or Viagra can cause autotoxicity. Some NSAIDs and other antibiotics, Y9 macrolides, can be toxic to the inner ear by damaging the inner hair cells. Exposure to certain chemicals and metals, especially in the workplace, can also damage the hair cells of the inner ear. Specific inner ear diseases can cause hearing loss. This is many years, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Trauma, head trauma or temporal bone fracture can cause uh, hearing loss, among others. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. Remember, the inner ear contains the cochlea and the semicircular canal. Even though the pathology is in the semicircular canal, the conduction of the sound waves through the fluids in the inner ear is also affected. So there is a concomitant hearing loss aside from the vertigo in patients with superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. I just want to point out that in the recent decades, most of the patients with vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus, and ear fullness were mostly diagnosed as many years disease. But with the birth of high-tech imaging techniques, especially in the CT scan, we have seen that much of the patients we diagnosed as many years before, we went back to them and we found out that they did not have many years, but instead they have superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. Autoimmune disorders, of course, can cause inner ear conditions and tumors. Malignancies are very uncommon. But what is not uncommon once in a while we encounter is the so-called acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma. It is a benign tumor of the nerve and it is, uh, by virtue of its um, location, can be life-threatening sometimes. Other diseases that the elderly may have, diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroidism, a bad luck having bacterial meningitis, stroke is not uncommon, AIDS, viral parotitis or mumps, measles, syphilis, not in the least but um, disease of the ear and corresponding nerves, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, uh, zoster or varicella syndromes can also affect the nerve and lead to hearing loss. This is very common and very relevant to all of us. The dangers of high noise levels have been well established. This is another cause for inner ear damage leading to sensory neural hearing loss. When you're exposed to 90 dB sound for a very long time or even just headphones, but for a long time and with a loud volume, you can have sensory neural hearing loss. Let's review the decibels, the unit of vo of the loudness of the sound. For a whisper, it's 30 dB. For conversation, it's 60 dB. For a hair dryer, it's 80 dB. For a chainsaw, which our workers can use, it's 105 dB. And look at the grenade, it's 164 dB. So once you're exposed to a, to a grenade, like in that movie Black Hawk Down, Instant acoustic trauma, instant permanent hair cell damage. You remember that movie, Black Hawk Down. So unsafe levels of noise, 70 dB is unsafe, especially if you have continuous noise exposure. And 125 dB can cause you pain. Noise can come not only for those who are exposed in the workplace, but for all of us through ambient environmental noise, personal audio electronics, acoustic trauma, workplace noise. 
You are only allowed eight hours if you are exposed to 85 dB like our seafarers who work in the engine room. They should wear their hearing protection gear because the noise in the engine room of our giant mega ships can range from 85 dB to 110 dB and they need their hearing protection gear for sound attenuation. Look at this. Heavy city traffic, Metro Manila, Cebuanos, and the Bawenos, 90 decibels. How many hours are we allowed? 90 decibels. Two hours in traffic. When we get old, we will have some form of noise-induced hearing loss if we don't really solve our traffic problems. Noise is the most studied environmental risk factor for hearing loss in adulthood. And the global burden is 16%. And sadly, the compliance to wearing hearing protection gear is slow. Nagpapamacho po, lalo na ang mga males, ayong isuot ang hearing protection gear. Why? They don't realize there's no, there's lack of awareness and they don't feel the hearing loss. Why? It comes after 10 to 20 years. It's gradual and insidious. By the time they are old, that's when they realize they should have worn their hearing protection gear. But do not despair. Many groups, government and private, are concerned with hazards of industrial noise and many have come up with hearing conservation regulations, increasing automation at work, shift from noisier industrial to quieter information-based economics. But I was researching about law. There is no law regulating hearing protection for those exposed. And just to share, look at the iPad. Your iPads do not have numbers on the decibel volume. Paano mo malalaman kung 100 dB, 80 dB? Naku, sabi ni Dr. Cruz, 2 hours lang pag 80, 90. But look, there's a dial. As long as you're less than 50%, keep it at 30 to 40. No limit. You can enjoy your iPad music. Last, presbycusis. Age-related hearing loss is the other name. It's a progressive bilateral symmetrical hearing loss most common in the elderly, it can be genetic, it can be due to physical environmental insults, physiologic stressors, or lifestyle behaviors, but it's mostly just nature taking its course. The loss is first in the higher frequencies. Anong nasa higher frequencies? Consonants, not vowels. Consonants make up most of our spoken human words. That's why the elderly will complain, I can hear the sound but I cannot understand the words. By the time you're over 80 years old, 50 to 80% of the population is affected. Again, the ramifications are serious and far-reaching on mental health, emotional well-being, self-esteem, interpersonal relations, pati family and caregivers na apektohan health-related quality of life, work possibilities, and career. The pathophysiology has been established. They saw the damage. Ang atin pong mga pumay, uh, namaya pa na, na subjects, those with presbycusis, they have studied and they saw the changes, mostly degenerative. Sensory, neural, strial, organ of cortis, spiral ganglion, stria vascularis, basilar membrane with degenerative changes. Population-based studies have shown that I want to point this out. Hearing loss is associated with more rapid deterioration in cognitive and physical function. Age-related sensory loss, including hearing loss, is associated with dementia and falls. You diagnose it by history, PE, and odometry. Rarely will you need imaging except... If you have an unexplained one-sided hearing loss, it may not be presbycusis. Pag presbycusis, dapat dalawa pantay. Pag isa lang, baka kung ano yon, Baka kailangan ng ibang pagsusuri gaya ng MRI or CT scan. Walang cure. Cannot be reversed. There are no approved medicines. Vitamin B, oxygen, stem cell. Once you've lost it, you can't have it back. 
You can maintain the level, prevent further damage. You can do rehab options, hearing aids, cochlear implants. There has to be instruction. There has to be perceptual training by professionals. I have great respect for our colleagues in the allied medical professions, the speech pathologists, the occupational therapists, the physical therapists. They help us with our elderly. Counseling is very important. Largely, it has been unrecognized by policymakers, but again, don't despair. Awareness is being widespread. Groups are concerned on how hearing loss affects healthy aging, the current deficits and barriers. And the barriers are lack of human resources, higher priority of other health issues, hypertension, diabetes, of course, cardiac arrest, uh, my, uh, ischemia, myocardial ischemia before hearing loss, lack of public awareness, lack of awareness about the profession of audiology, audiology education programs are lacking, lack of government funding, high cost of hearing aids, and limited access to hearing health care. Again, don't despair. May pag-asa po, pati ang Pilipinas, lack of human resources, the National Hearing Screening a reference center, the Philippine National Ear Institute of the National Institutes of Health, both housed in the University of the Philippines, Manila, the Philippine Society of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, the Paynors, the PISAUD, they have people who are experts and who can provide experts. Higher priority, we have got, done researches, we have advocated, we have proposed policies to our congressmen, to our senators, for them to take notice of hearing loss. Awareness to the lay, missions, trainings, with the use of popular and social media, it cannot be too hard. Audiology is addressed by the UP College of Medicine and the UP camp since 20 years ago, and UST, Cebu and La Salle and other schools have followed. Lack of government funding, that's not true. Department of Health, PCSO, PhilHealth, PhilHealth now provides for pediatric hearing losses. Wala pa po for the elderly. PCSO po tayo for hearing aids for the elderly. High cost of hearing aids with technology, lalabas na rin po ang assistive listening device at ang hearing aids na mas mura. And access, dapat po, concentrated tayo, just like the UP College of Medicine, sa community-based strategies. Priorities for future service delivery and research, development, and training of all levels of providers for hearing health. Provision of incentives to help the exodus of professionals to developed countries, especially our audiologists. Creation of education models should address specific needs. Development of consumer electronic approaches. Over-the-counter hearing aids, why not? Adoption of patient-centered, community-delivered approaches. Reduction of hearing aid stigma. Baka pwede pong gumawa ng hearing aid na mas maporma ang dating. Conduction of educational programs for people with hearing loss and their family members and caregivers essential to be included. And greater use of the web to provide education, hearing screening, assessment, and treatments. In summary, normal hearing is dependent on normal anatomy and functioning of the ear and the brain. Hearing loss can be due to various factors. The aging population is significantly burdened by this. Management depends upon, upon the specific cause. For breast bicusis, it has to be a holistic uh, approach, and we have identified the future efforts that are necessary. You are familiar with this quotation, blindness separates us from things, but deafness separates us from people. Hearing that is normal is essential to a good life. Regarding hearing aids, this is my favorite slide. One of the best hearing aids a man can have is an attentive wife. Hearing aids are aids. They are not solutions. So take care of your ears. Thank you for lending your ears in this webinar. And these are some of my references. Thank you again. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Cruz, for that comprehensive talk. Um, so I hope this webinar will be also um, helpful to increase awareness so that there will be more advocates for uh, hearing health care and occupational safety for uh, against noise pollution. Um, yeah. So we now have 37 people viewing through UP Manila live stream, 91 through YouTube live, and 470 people through Facebook live. And there are other groups viewing from all over the Philippines also. Um, so we'd like to um, extend our special thanks to Active Hearing Center Center, who is our sponsor for today's webinar. Okay, so the floor is now open for questions from the audience. Just type in your questions at the Q&A chat box in the right lower corner of the live stream window. Or type in comments in YouTube Live or send personal messages to FB at Aging Webinars for Facebook Live viewers. We have a few questions already from here. Okay. So from Maria Lisa Ang Santos, may I ask what is the mechanism behind the genetic predisposition to hearing loss? Okay. Um, the genetic predisposition is, un is unidentified. The genetic predisposition is unidentified. But as I said, more than 40 genes have been identified. But the predisposition have been identified, but the predisposition to have those genes are not identified. The most common, as you know, thing is the Conexin 26 gene. And maybe this is an aside, but I'm very proud of our work in Aklan, mm -hmm. where we have adopted an indigenous group of our Kababayans, and we have um, identified a gene. I did not memorize the number that is linked with um, chronic superative otitis media uh, causing hearing loss. And the predisposition is not proven, but it could be really racial to, uh, as a predisposition. But the mechanism per se for hearing loss has not been uh, definitely established. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier medications as a common cause for uh, for uh, mm -hmm. hearing loss. No? So there is, uh, including NSAIDs. So there's a question from Raul Ipil. What is the effect of prolonged intake of aspirin tablets on hearing loss? Okay. Um, uh, any, I always say this. All chemicals have possible adverse side effects. Sometimes it's really the the constitution also of the person if a particular chemical will have a side effect. For most of the chemicals or medications like aspirin, the possible the side effect is in the damage the side effect of healing loss is caused by damage to the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells of the cochlea. So similar for most similar medications. Similar for most medications. Some medications are favorably cochleotoxic, meaning damaging the cochlea more, like streptomycin. And some aminoglycosides are more for vestibulotoxic, like vancomycin. That's why our code is VV. <laughs> vancomycin, vestibulotoxic. So... A uh, patient may not have uh, severe hearing loss, but patient may have severe vertigo because of the vestibular toxicity. So autotoxicity can be cochleotoxic or vestibular toxic. Cochleotoxic leading to hearing loss, vestibular toxic leading to vertigo, and most drugs affecting both. Um, we have some anonymous questions. How can we prevent hearing loss from ambient noise? Uh, you mentioned this, but maybe it would be good to remind people. Okay. So, sorry for the way I'll answer, but I'll say common sense. Uh, you go to a rock concert, even if the ticket is cheap, do not sit on the chair that is right beside the speakers emitting 90 to 110. You will have at the very least, what we call a temporary threshold shift. After you exit the concert hall, you will have ringing in the ears, temporary damage to your hair cells. It can be reversed after one to three days. 
But sometimes you may not be so lucky. You may have um, blast and therefore you may have permanent damage to your uh, hair cells. So avoidance of situations that will put you in exposure of dangerous noise will be the best way. So analyze the situation. Don't go into situations where you will have this dangerous the, uh, noise levels. Now, for those who do not have a choice, by virtue of your profession, you're a seafarer, you're in the engine room of the ship, you're a construction worker uh, using the jackhammer for more than eight hours a day, please wear your hearing protection gear. Wala pong bigay ang kumpanya, doktora eh. Bumili ka. Bumili ka ng para sa'yo. Kasi, I tell my seafarers, kayo po ang naho-homesick. Kayo po ang nagtatrabaho. Nag-iipon kayo. Pagtandaan niyo po, kahit na po may pera kayo pambili ng hearing aid, maari pong hindi na siya kasing useful sa inyo. Kasi yung mismong organ na magpa-process ng ipipid ng hearing aid, which is the inner ear, can already be permanently damaged. So while there is still time, wear your hearing protection gear. What is the best? Earbuds at patungan pa ng headphones. Earbuds alone, 10, 20 dB. The same with headphones alone. But if you combine them, you can have a 40 to 50 decibel lessening or attenuation of the sound that you will be exposed to. So invest in your safety. Prevention is the key. The next one is a similar question. I think you'll answer it. Is there a difference if we listen to the same volume on speakers versus earphones? Yes, very good question. I prefer headphones rather than earbuds. Vibration, not only studies have shown, vibration, not only volume, but vibration of the sound waves can lead to inner ear damage. Why did they conclude this? Again, see favors. Those in the engine room and those in the deck right above the engine room have no significant difference in the severity of their noise-induced hearing loss. So it is not just the volume of the sound per se, but the waves that are transmitted by these loud noises. So, mas maganda, mas malayo ang source ng ating sound kesa sa diretsyong nasa loob ng ating tenga. So aside from just volume, distance from the source of sound mm -hmm. and uh, vibrations, yes. uh, exposure vibrations. to the vibrations mm -hmm. are important when talking about uh, uh, noise-induced noise -induced hearing loss. Okay. So what can we do? So a lot of our problems uh, are not, uh, some of the problems also mm -hmm. are, cannot be corrected anymore. So what we do uh, is to propose hearing aids. So there's a question, what can we do when people find hearing aids uncomfortable to wear? Okay. That's a very good question. Oh, sorry. And related, mm -hmm. the current hearing aids provide 100% restoration to hearing loss. Okay. Second question first. Do he, look at the words. Look at the question. Do hearing aids provide 100% and the crucial word, restoration of hearing. Hearing that is damaged due to inner ear disease cannot be restored anymore. It can only be a dead. So what is a hearing aid? A hearing aid is a high-tech microphone. It is an aid. It is not the cure for the disease or the problem. So... I answered the yes, second, second question. One. Hindi gaya po ng salamin ang hearing aid. 
Napakadali po kung ang salamin, ang use ng salamin para sa panlalabo ng mata kesa sa use ng hearing aid. First of all, dun sa mababaw na dahilan, pwede pang ang pamporma yung, yung glasses eh. Pamahalan pa nga po minsan ng glasses. Ako, 50 pesos lang. Calling on Alnetan. <laughs> so, hearing aids and hearing are much more complicated. The hearing mechanism is complicated. You just don't add volume and it will receive it and transmit the volume as such, as the sound as such. Hearing aids are associated with the stigma also. Some people do not like that other people will see that they are wearing hearing aids. With hearing aids, there's a problem called, sorry, with press by pussies, there's a problem called recruitment. Recruitment is the abnormal processing of the sound by the inner ear. So that louder sounds may actually be already painful to the hearing impaired. So there's a narrow range of frequencies and volume that are acceptable and comfortable to the damaged inner ear. And the technology of the hearing aid should be able to address that. So the question is, what can we do? First of all, before getting a hearing aid, the diagnosis should be well established. There should be careful and expert testing and there should be careful and expert hearing aid fitting and trial. Hindi ho agad bibili lamang ng walang advice ng experts, lalo na po ng ear, nose, and throat doctors. Kasi po baka masayang lamang, you will end up with your hearing aid in the drawer. Kasi hindi naman po yun ang naging solusyon sa problema. But nevertheless, I would like to emphasize, hearing aids, when appropriate, are very useful for the rehabilitation of the hearing impaired, especially the elderly. Hearing aids have been proven to help uh, our elderly hear better and lead happier and more interactive lives. So since for now that's our option, then uh, we avail of that. I mentioned cochlear implantation. Maybe not yet as practiced commonly in our setting, but it is an accepted modality for hearing rehabilitation. It's an electro displaced in the inner ear. It's a surgical procedure to implant um, uh, cochlear implant. And studies have shown that cochlear implantation in the elderly population suffering from press by cousis have shown good results. There's actually a question here. Uh, is there a difference in the effectiveness of cochlear implants in geriatric patients as opposed to pediatric patients? So, Okay, very good question. Um, the pediatric population is so much more difficult uh, because they have not learned yes. to hear. They were born uh, with profound hearing loss. It's with profound hearing losses that you do the cochlear implantation for. So definitely the results, especially if you catch them at a later age and they haven't heard anything since birth, the results for prelingual, what we call those who never develop speech, will uh, expectedly be a little more guarded than those who have been already been hearing. You are educated. You review. can read it's faces. Only a review of it's a review. Yeah. So that's good news actually for the elderly that cochlear implants work well. Yes. Okay. Going back to hearing aids, there's a question about you know, people. Uh, when should the elderly be brought to the ENT for screening? Do mm -hmm. they wait for uh, the people to complain yes. or the companions to complain that they don't hear? Or is there an age or what is the recommendation? So practically speaking, you wait for someone to complain. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is, uh, according to literature, um, 
there's not much advocacy for hearing screening in the elderly. The American Society of Audiology has proposed every three years your tone audiometry screening, but the cost effectivity of this procedure has not been proven. Government is not willing to fund. What, first of all, the it's almost a not, it's not a disease in most cases. And secondly, if there's no complaint, um, it's not really a life-threatening condition. And if there is a condition, then the options are not uh, very widespread. But in contrast to pediatric hearing screening, so in the pediatric, you know that we have a newborn hearing screening as a rule. So hearing screening, no need, mostly. I advise when someone is complaining and when the patient is willing. Do not bring Lolo and Lola frowning to the doctor. <laughs> Hindi naman po ako bingi eh. But it's up to the doctor. The doctor can usually talk to Lolo or Lola. Oh, plus they, they can, you know, you can buy them the most expensive hearing aid, but if they don't use it because they don't want to, because they do not believe that thing is sila, it's not going to be effective. Yes, there's a lot of education and counseling involved. That's why impacted serumen is the best. Oh, so there are a lot of questions about impacted serumen. Oh. So yeah, the questions are Ganun how I said we go. Yeah, so how, how do you how how uh, how often do you uh, how do you propose they clean their ears at home, and how often should they go see an ENT for ear cleaning or ear examination? Okay, so how often? So this is my general across the board advice for the pediatric up to the elderly. Do not be so obsy about earwax or obsessive compulsive. As I mentioned, earwax is not a disease. It's a normal product of the ear. What you do every day after taking your bath, just get your towels and towel dry the outside of your ears. Do not use your cotton buds every day because the ears have a self-cleansing mechanism. Without us realizing it, squames from the skin, parts of the wax already fall off and we wipe them with the towel. The more we interfere with this normal physiology, the more we can lead, to, uh, we are prone to impacted serumen. So cotton buds, once a week only. So the question is, how often should a person visit an ENT specialist for proper cleaning, irrigation of ears? Okay. When you have, when you have a complaint. We are not, it's uh, not like the prophylax, prophylaxis for dental health. Now, I'll yeah. go every six months to the dentist because I might have cavities which might destroy my teeth. Wax will not destroy your ear. Pag may naramdaman, pumunta sa ENT, the ENT will deal with the situation there and then. Pag walang nararamdaman, pwedeng hindi pumunta. I'm talking about impacted serumen or serumen, ha? So, quick answer. Uh, quick question. Though. From uh, Davao City, Edeline Mayon asks, uh, are baby oil or any oils helpful in the removal of insects that are usually recommended by elderly? Yes, you can use baby oil to drown the insects. You can also use hydrogen peroxide. Um, if the patient has a history of luga or ear discharge, better use hydrogen peroxide because that's more sterile. Pag butas po kasi ang eardrum, dapat sterile ang makakarating sa middle ear. Kung gagamit kayo ng baby oil, usually hindi siya sterile, baka magkaroon pa po tayo ng infection. So we have time for just one more question. So very easy to answer, but I think a lot of people are interested. From Nat Ralios, is ear candling advisable for ear cleaning? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so in summary, we learned from the webinar today that uh, hearing loss is an important global concern, especially in the elderly. And um, specific causes must be managed accordingly. We learned about so many, and each one is 
treated differently, so they really need to be identified. And research and advocacy must focus on addressing hearing loss in the aging population. So again, I hope this webinar increased some awareness and created in some of you a passion to advocate for the uh, hearing loss in the aging population. So with that, we'd like to thank Dr. Tetsch yes, Cruz for you. that uh, one for taking time out of her schedule and sharing her expertise with us today. Uh, please stay tuned for some reminders. The Aging and Longevity Medical Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority would like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. We are also grateful to support from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, UP Manila Information Management Service, and DOST ASTI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we thank you, our participants, for spending your lunch hour with us. To receive your certificates of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation through the link that will be sent to your email addresses after you sign the attendance sheet for today's webinar. The certificates will then be emailed to your registered email addresses within two to four weeks. Here is a quick view of the schedule of our upcoming webinars. For more details and updates, please check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash agingwebinars and our Twitter timeline at twitter.com slash agingwebinars. Today's webinar recording and all webinar recordings may be viewed at YouTube at Aging Webinars channel. We are also announcing the launch of the OB Pearls book. Get your copies now. Thank you, and have a great day. We'd like to invite you to attend uh, the other uh, Aging and Longevity Medical webinars also. The next one will be on August 30. Uh, this will be on multidisciplinary care in head and neck cancer. Uh, there are all, please also attend the uh, med webinars. They are held every Wednesday. And these are the topics. Thank you very much for your attendance.